Hey Church, it's great that you can join us. Uh, we are continuing our series of Lessons from the Journey, looking at the Israelites as they journeyed through the wilderness and into the Promised Land and seeing what lessons that we can learn today for us as we look individually and collectively at the journey that we're on. And so I'm just going to pray and give our time over to God and ask that he speaks to each, each one of us, including myself. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you that your word speaks to us today. And Lord, that as you tell us what to do, as you command us uh, to live out the life that you've called us to, that we can rely on your Holy Spirit to strengthen us and to guide us. That it's not dependent upon how strong we are, how clever we are, but it's, a, it's dependent upon how much we rely and depend on you. Amen. So um, I am going to be uh, continuing this, uh, looking at different lessons from the journey, and we're going to be looking at grumbling. And if you've got a Bible, feel free to turn to 1 Corinthians 10, verses 1 to 12. And so this is Paul writing. He said, I don't want you to forget, dear brothers and sisters, about our ancestors in the wilderness long ago. All of them were guided by a cloud that moved ahead of them and walked, and all of them walked through the sea on dry ground. In the cloud and in the sea, all of them were baptized as followers of Moses. All of them ate the same spiritual food and all of them drank the same spiritual water, for they drank from the spiritual rock that traveled with them, and that rock was Christ. Yet God was not pleased with most of them, and their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. These things happened as a warning to us, so that we would not crave evil things as they did, or worship idols as some of them did. As the scriptures say, the people celebrated with feasting and drinking, and they indulged in pagan revelry. And we must not engage in sexual immorality, as some of them did causing 23,000 of them to die in one day. Nor should we put Christ to the test, as some of them did, and then died from snake bites. And don't grumble, as some of them did, and then were destroyed by the angel of death. These things happened to them as examples for us. They were written down to warn us who live at the end age. So if you think you are standing strong, be careful not to fall. This is uh, an incredible passage and one which really uh, seeks to give us warning about how to live our lives. So this, what we've been told by Paul is, these, it's not just a documented story which has happened thousands of years ago, but this is a story of, of what has happened that is supposed to have an impact upon how we live our lives today. We're supposed to take their lessons, the things that they've learned or the things that they did wrong, and we're supposed to interpret that for today so that we can avoid making those mistakes or we can actually enter into what God is doing as they did. And so the, the background of this passage is actually from what we know of the, the Israelites, that they entered into uh, the promised land and they were on the outskirts and they sent some spies in to go and see what was going on, to see um, what the land was like. And they came back, the spies all came back uh, with, this, with the same report that this was a land of flowing with milk and honey, that there were massive grapes and this was a, a land uh, of plentiful. But also some of the spies came back and said, yeah, but we can't take this land. We can't inherit this land. The enemies, they're too big for us. They're too strong for us. There's nothing that we can, we can do. And the people began to grumble. But even as um, Joshua and Caleb, the, the two faithful spies, they said, yes, yeah, that is true. There are these giants and they, they are um, very scary, they're big people. 
and we look small to them, but we have God on our side. God is going to go before us and we can take the land because God has promised us the land. But even though they managed, they gave the, um, this really positive view on it in light of what God was going to do, actually the people began to grumble and they began to moan. They said, oh, we should have stayed in Egypt. Our lives are so much better there. I mean, their memories were so short. And what's incredible as well, you think they had seen God act in incredible ways. He had brought the plagues and Pharaoh had released his grip. So they'd also they'd seen these miraculous plagues happen. And as well, they had seen the angel of death come in and kill the, the newborns of the Egyptian hold, but, households, but not of their own. They had walked through the Red Sea, the mass mass people walking through the sea. God made a way through for them. But yet this for them was something that was just too big for God. God could not do this. Even though he had done all those incredible things back in Egypt and earlier on in their journey, this was something that they couldn't expect God to achieve and and do for them. And so they began uh, to grumble. And because of their grumbling, God said, okay, I'm, I'm sick of your grumbling. I'm sick of you saying this. So actually, you're, you're not going to inherit uh, the promised land. I'm going to wait. I'm going to take you through the wilderness. And those that are over the age of 21, I'm going to wait for you to die off because of their grumbling. And so they were grumbling about where God had led them. God had taken them to that place. And they had been asking for a savior. They'd been asking God to to set them free from the oppression that they were experiencing at the hands of the Egyptians. Yet they then began very quickly complaining about the exact place where God had led them. I don't know about you, but I certainly know that I can be very quick to complain about places that God has led me. Um, I don't know if you've, you've ever been in a job. And God has opened a way. You've prayed for that job. You've asked God, oh, please, I want this interview to go well or bless my work and and all these different things that we can pray. But yet when we're in those those jobs and we're doing those things, we can begin to complain. So, oh, well, the, you know, this isn't working out. And, oh, my job's so boring at the moment or it's so hard. I've got all these these people. Or, what, what What's going on? And begin to, to have a moaning and a grumbling uh, spirit. But the same can be had with anything. You know, it might be you might have been praying for a house. You get into the house and then you've got to deal with a leak and then you moan about the leak. Or you've got some difficult neighbours and you begin to moan and grumble about the the neighbours. You might be a prey to get into a particular university. You get in, but then when you're there, you're you're moaning. Oh, the lectures aren't very good or or it's it's really difficult. It's hard work. You know, I've done, I've moaned about these things. I've, I've grumbled about it. Um, but I think what we need to understand is like from this, from, and from what we read in this story, the whole Israelites had the same, the the same spiritual gifts, the same things, and they experienced the same things. That's what it tells us, um, in verse, uh, verses one to four. It, It says that how the cloud was with them. That was God's presence going with them and before them and surrounding them. And so, um, they had that cloud during the day and they had a fire at night. God was providing for them. And so they experienced the same thing, yet the outcome was different for different people, depending on, on whether they grumbled or not. So the stakes uh, are so high on this. And Joyce Meyer uh, puts it like this. She says, a lot of people will never get to where they want to be because they will never stop complaining about where they are at. And we see that with the the Israelites. They never stopped complaining about where they were at. And so they never got to where they wanted to be. God said no. And as well in this passage, Paul draws the comparison to some pretty awful things. I mean, we can think, oh, well, you know, I'm just just grumbling. I mean, how, how, how bad can it be? But Paul's pretty clear. He he puts it on the same level. Uh, as evil desires, as idol worship, 
So putting anything uh, above God, our, our love and our desires and our thoughts and our hopes, anything like that above God. Uh, demonic revelry, uh, sexual immorality. So any sort of sexual activity that's outside the confines of, of a marriage between a man and a woman. Um, and testing Christ, putting Christ to the test and, and, and doubting him. These are quite big things. And yet grumbling is put on the same, um, the same level as this. And the reason is, is because grumbling complains directly or either indirectly uh, and it, towards God. And it's saying that God's not either sufficiently good, uh, faithful, loving, wise, powerful or competent. Because if he was, we wouldn't be experiencing what we're experiencing. He would treat us better or he'd run the world better. And so we, every time we grumble, every time we enter into that, we, we're saying that, yeah, God, you're not loving enough. You, you're not wise enough. You, you don't really know what you're doing. Because if you did, I wouldn't be experiencing all these things that are going on. So grumbling is sinful because it accuses God of doing wrong. Now, I don't... I don't want us to get confused uh, about uh, like sort of faithful complaining or like laments because the Bible is filled with lament. People who do let out cries of complaint to God because, and, that, and that's biblical. But what's different about that is that it's, it's rooted in uh, a faith and a trust of God. So what faithful complaint is, what lament is, um, is... It's rather like an honest, uh, groaning expression of what it's like to experience trouble, anguish, and the grief of living in a fallen world. God wants to know about that. He doesn't want us to just go and pretend as if everything's fine and just all sunshine and roses. He wants us to be honest with him about how we're feeling. But the foundation of that is that we are we are going to trust God. We are going to trust God during this time. And actually, that we're going to believe uh, that God is in control. So, I mean, I know that the sort of, I, I can experience the difference between sort of um, grumbling and lamenting with uh, my children. So Lily and Archie, um, they have, during lockdown, experienced a heck of a lot of walking. So that was, especially early on, that was one of the only things that we could do, just going out walking. And they'd be like, oh, you know, why are we, why are we going out walking all the time? Why is this uh, all that we can do? And uh, part of it was doubting that what we were doing with them and taking them out and going on walking was, was what, what's best for them. You know, what's best for them isn't to be stuck indoors all day, being restricted, but it's about being out there, getting exercise, doing things. Now, I, I understood that. And so when they questioned it uh, continually, and they were like, oh, this is so boring. Why are we having to do this? Oh, another walk. Oh, like that became quite frustrating because it's like, no, this is this is good for you. I know this is good for you. Uh, you might not feel that way, but it is. And I think we can do, definitely do this, the same with God. God has that bigger picture. He can understand what, what's good for us. And there have been times where we've, we've been out on, on walks and we're going to different places and it doesn't take long before they grumble. It's like, I, look, where we're headed, you want to be on this path. You want to be on this path because at the end, we're headed to an ice cream store. That's where we're going. Oh, no, this is so long. This is so like, and they're not believing what we're doing is best for them and that you know there's going to be good at the end of the destination and I think we need to recognize that you know grumbling does it's not because of some external thing that we have going on outside uh, of us like any situation but it's actually a problem that is is going on in here and, and we know that because of what scripture says you know, there's no outward circumstance which compels us to grumble because uh, it's the same Paul 
who said, do all things without grumbling. That's a command. And he is actually managing to say that when he is awaiting death, when he is in chains, he's in prison at this time. But he's saying, actually, if you're a follower of Jesus, you need to do all things without complaining. That, without grumbling. That is literally what he's saying. And what's also fascinating as well is he, he says that in, in Philippians 2.14. And the book of Philippians is absolutely drenched in gratitude. Um, there is so much in it where he is saying, you know, be, be thankful in all circumstances. Uh, he's thanking them for, for the people and the generosity and all the things that are good. He's able to do that. And if anyone had an opportunity to complain, it was Paul. I mean, you think about all the things that he experienced. He's experiencing being shipwrecked, being flogged, being beaten, being, being stoned, uh, having churches turn against him, having people abandon him left, right and centre, ending up being in prison for doing exactly what God has told him to do. It's led him to being in prison, awaiting execution. So if anyone had the right to complain, it was Paul. Yet he said, do all these things without grumbling. And it was a man who um, was just incredibly grateful for, for God's blessings. So I think when we catch ourselves grumbling, we need to ask ourselves, is it that I don't trust that God loves me? Or is it that I don't trust that God is in control? Because I think we have to, it has to be one or, one or the other. Either, you know, as we're grumbling, we're kind of saying what we're experiencing and what we're going through, um, God, doesn't, God doesn't care about. Um, so he doesn't, he doesn't love me. He doesn't care uh, for me uh, in this way because otherwise th this would be gone. Or we're saying that God isn't in control and he, he, doesn't, uh, he doesn't really uh, know what he's doing. And throughout uh, lockdown, I've the, my, probably one of my biggest prayers is, is, has been, can I endure with joy during this time? Can I, because it can be quite, I don't know, it can be easier to endure something, to go through it, but to actually do that and go th through something that, which is quite challenging, quite difficult with joy is sort of the next, the next level. And so I, I've noticed and I've caught myself sort of during this time being like, yeah, I'm enduring, but uh, having a moan and, and beginning to, um, uh, to complain about that. And, and something which has always stuck with me, I was out on a, a mission trip in Rwanda and we, were, we had people from all different parts of Africa coming and receiving training on sports ministry. And uh, I was out there for... I think it was around uh, two weeks, and it had just been at the same time that, that Beck had gone back to work uh, after being on maternity leave with Archie. So I was having to muddle along and get used to a, a new pattern of going to work whilst I'm away, which is always a, a bit challenging, and dropping off Lily and Archie with the, the times not working out brilliantly. So I remember I'd made uh, friends with a guy from Burundi, Pacific, and we were we were talking, and he said, uh, "How are things? How are things going uh, back at home?" I said, "Oh, yeah. Oh, well, you know, things are a bit difficult. Uh, my wife uh, Beck is is working, and and as I said, and as I said that, he just praise God, praise Jesus. Wow, uh, incredible! Y your wife works. Oh, wonderful." Oh wow! This is so. This is so good. Oh, we give glory to God uh, that Ben, that Ben's wife, uh, Beck works, because for him, he had been striving um, with his wife trying to find work. She's very well educated, highly educated, but living in Burundi, as they were, living in real poverty and real difficulty even though she has a, a degree, to try and find work was in incredibly difficult. And I tell you, when he said that, 
I, I, I just felt such shame. I felt such shame that I was, I was moaning, I was grumbling to someone who not only was experiencing so much more hardship than I have or ever will do, um, but someone as well who was just so grateful to God, so grateful to God, even on my behalf, what I should have been expressing, what I should have been expressing, he was expressing. And uh, recently I've, I've, I've watched The Killing Fields, which is all about um, the genocide in Cambodia. And uh, on Wednesday at church, we watched Free Burma Rangers. And part of both of those experiences, you just see so much suffering that is going on in the world. And part of me is just saying, oh, you know, I never want to complain again. I never want to grumble again. The things that I grumble about, yes, I, and I have experienced hardship, but my goodness, have I experienced what it's like to, to flee from war-torn areas or to lose family members to, um, to genocide? No, not at all. But in both of these experiences of, of watching these things, seeing people who can still be uh, a people of joy, and uh, people of, of, of gratitude. And I think that's what we need to adapt. To overcome grumbling, we need an attitude of gratitude. Because a grateful person will not grumble. They just won't. You, you just don't see it. With people who are truly grateful, um, you just don't see them grumbling. And I think as well, part of it is, you can't grumble and praise God at the same time. I think that that was the, the biggest thing for me when I saw when I was out in Rwanda and I had that experience with Pacific. I was wanting to grumble. He was wanting to, to praise God. And I couldn't praise God uh, whilst grumbling. And he couldn't grumble on my behalf while he was giving praise to God on my behalf. And so if we want to be a people of praise, we need to lay down, um, lay down grumbling. I mean, as well, part of it is, we lose our peace. We lose, lose our peace. We lose our joy when we grumble. Uh, and it affects us. And if you don't believe me, all you've got to do is spend some time with people uh, who grumble. Or spend some time with people who are um, a joyful people. Because uh, I've, uh, I've worked quite a few years ago um, with, this, with, with this person who, who just constantly grumbled and complained about everything and had an experience of just anything that this person were, were talking about it's like, is, is nothing going right in, in your life. And I, and I found it draining to be around. And I felt my joy and my peace was being zapped away when I was having to spend uh, time with this person because they, they just had no joy in their life. Um, yet, I know what it's like to then spend, uh, spend time with people who are full of joy, who are full of gratitude, people who, who don't grumble. I mean, if you've ever spent time with Naomi Jalal or you've spent time with Karen Walsh, you'll know what it's like to be around people of joy, people of gratitude. When I'm around them, it lifts me up because I don't, I don't hear them grumbling. I don't hear them complaining. And, and they experience hardship and difficulty. Yet being around them is incredibly, it builds you up, it lifts you up, and it's a, a, a pleasure to have that experience. And so I, I know what I want to be. I don't want to be someone who people dread being around because they're like, oh man, being around Ben, you know, he's, he's got nothing to be grateful for. He's always going to be grumbling and complaining about the things that, that he's experiencing. Uh, I want to be someone who people want to be around because I, I'm giving glory to God. I'm praising God for all that he's done. Because God has done so much for us. He's given us, first of all, he's, he's given us life. In Free Burma Rangers, uh, one of, the, one of the, the kids, the missionary kids, they, he said, um, yeah, the thing I'm so grateful to God for is, is that I have life and that, uh, that I'm alive. I mean, he can't be more than 12 years old, but the thing that he has given thanks to God for just in normal conversation is being alive. We can be grateful for being alive. We can be grateful for salvation. Jesus Christ died for you. He died for me. He died on a cross to take away all of our sin, all of, all of our rebellion, all of our living against God, putting other people above God. He died for that. He took that all away. And 
Whoever believes in him won't perish, but will have eternal life. We can be grateful. And I think one of the other things as well that we need to recognize if we're to, truly going to get rid of grumbling from our lives is we need to recognize that scripture is full of promises. And some of those promises are about suffering, that we will experience suffering. If we follow Jesus Christ, we will have trouble in this world. Jesus said that himself. We'll have trouble in this world, but take heart for I've overcome the world. And I think uh, Jesus says in Matthew, he says, your mistake is that you don't know the scriptures. And so if as Christians, we think that we are immune to suffering because we know Jesus or that we should be or that we we deserve that in our lives. Read scripture. You're a mistake. You don't you don't know the scriptures. And uh, Peter says uh, in 1 Peter 4 verse 12, like, don't be surprised when you're going through um, fiery trials as if something strange were happening to you. Don't be surprised about it. We shouldn't be taken by surprise of, oh my God, like life is difficult, life is hard, and that, that we're going through um, all these different challenges at this time. And I think if we live in a life that sort of, um, where we expect everything to, to go well, we, we are going to be people that crumble. We are going to be people who complain and that aren't, aren't joyful to be around because we're not even aware that actually we have been promised that we will suffer. But in that, we can take heart for Christ has overcome the world. And what's interesting uh, about the Israelites and the lessons from the journey, especially uh, around grumbling, is that uh, when, the, when the Israelites had finished burying the last of this grumbling generation, uh, Moses revealed God's purpose in, in the desert. So in Deuteronomy, it talks about like God led you through uh, the wilderness, like with all the trials and tribulations that you had. But he says this in verse 16, that he might humble you and test you to do good in the end, to do you good in the end. So he's saying the whole purpose of these trials and the things that you experienced were that God would humble you and that he would test you to do good to you in the end. God's purpose in the trials and their suffering were to do them good. So what, how tragic is that for these, for these people, for the people that died in the wilderness? that they grumbled against God's purposes for good for them. Now, yeah, I'm not saying that it would have been easy. I'm not saying that it would have been a nice experience to go through that. But it was for their own good. God allowed them to suffer. He took them through these, these trials and this, this period of testing for their own good. How often can we grumble against what God is doing for our own good? But it comes to that. Do we believe that God is in control? Do we believe that he is sovereign, that he could change things in an instant if he could? But he hasn't. He hasn't chosen to do that in lots of circumstances. Some circumstances, God comes in and he changes it. But other times, God allows these things to humble us so we remain dependent upon him, to test us, to see what's in our heart, and to do good to us in the end. That whole generation missed out on what was supposed to be uh, good for them because they grumbled. And I think the challenge for us collectively, uh, for those of you who are, who are part of the church, is as we have now moved <laughs> into like a bit of uh, a promised land with the, with the walled garden. I mean, what a blessing, what an incredible blessing that we have. When we were meeting as a leadership team during this time and thinking, where, where are we going to meet? You know, when, as the restri restrictions begin to um, come on, be taken away, thinking, what is it that we're going to do? How are we going to uh, be able to do this? God, what, what are you saying? What, what do you have? And, and humanly speaking, there was nothing, absolutely nothing in the way. And, and you probably have heard of all the different words 
and the way that God has opened us up um, to be where we are. So God has made a way. But we now have an opportunity. Are we now going to grumble about where God has led us? Because just because we're, we're in this place doesn't mean that, you know, there's not going to be um, trials. Doesn't mean there's not going to be things, difficulty, things to, to have to work through. But are we going to grumble about where God has led us? You know, this is an opportunity to give thanks and praise to God. Yeah, not everything's going to be perfect. But we also have to recognise, just like in that Deuteronomy verse, that summing up of, of their journey and, and why they went through that. They went through that to be humbled and to be tested for their own good. Now, as we move into the wall garden, as we do church there, as we have the opportunity to come together, when we are experiencing testing times and things being difficult, oh, it's, it's, it's not warm enough or there's a, a lot of noise or um, the seats aren't comfortable, whatever the particulars might be, as things get darker or, you know, it's, it's far to travel, um, my bus was late or, or whatever it is, and there will be legitimately things that will be inconvenient to us and, and will be problematic. But are we going to see these, that, that God, God has brought us here and that he, will, he wants to humble us? He wants to test us for our own good. And are we going to get behind that? Because I want to be uh, a person uh, who has gratitude for all that God has done. And I want us as a church to represent that as well. I want us to be a people of praise, people who are going to get behind what God is doing and thank him for all that he's done. I mean, we are so blessed to be able to, to meet together at this time. And I know for some of you, um, even watching now, you're having to watch at home. Um, but we are so blessed to be able to live in a society where we can be Christians. There are so many countries across the world where the very act of going to church can cost you your life. And that is a reality. That is a reality which has faced and plagued the church for thousands of years. That is a reality. But we take it for granted in this country and, and things can be difficult, but we need to hold it in that perspective and be grateful for what God is doing. Lord, I want to thank you. I want to thank you for what you are doing in my life. I want to thank you for what you are doing in our church. And Lord, would you help us to see that when we are faced with difficulty, when we are faced with, with trials, that this is an opportunity to be humbled, to be tested for our, our own good. And Lord, I pray that we would respond to those trials, to press into you, to lean into you, to recognise our dependence upon you. And that we would respond with praise and thanksgiving for all that you have done. In Jesus' name, Amen. And if you don't know Jesus Christ for yourself, if you've never experienced this God who loves you and who cares for you and has a plan and a purpose for your life and can take away your sin, we are all in need of a saviour. We all need someone who can do that. And that someone is Jesus Christ. And he's already paid the price. But it's us to, for us to respond, to respond to that good news. And if you want to respond to that good news, please message us as a church and we'd love to be able to pray for you and tell you what it means to become a Christian, what it means to be sold out and live your life for Jesus. Is victory.
Sweet. 